Sí. ¿Y a quién le pagamos? ¿A ti?
solo su preocupación en las instituciones, sino también en el mundo y en las universidades. Tienen como un poco de todo, pero es una preocupación en realidad. Yeah, yeah, yeah? Much, yeah. Okay. I can see. No, no. Yeah, because then people will uh, email me and say you said that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's start. Um, Necesitamos el apuntador. Uh -huh. Sí. Sí, ven. Ven bien, sí. Okay. So let me just uh, okay. introduce you again. Again. Okay. It's going to be quicker. Y tal vez toda ya se ve bien, sí, verdad? Sí. Bueno, pues eh, buenas tardes a todos y a todas, por, eh, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, este, algunos de ustedes creo que, no sé si todos, todos estuvieron en la sesión de la mañana, no. ¿Sí? No, hay algunos que no, ¿verdad? Pero, eh, pues bueno, este, para los que no estuvieron, pues muy bienvenidos, nos da mucho gusto que estén aquí el día de hoy. Y, eh, y pues bueno, para los que ya estuvieron, yo creo que esta va a ser un tema un poquito diferente también, aunque va a estar más o menos este, tomando algunos de los elementos con los que estuvo platicando esta mañana. Pero, este, pero bueno, creo que también va a ser un seminario un poquito más eh, académico de, en cierto sentido y sobre todo lo que el profesor de Seti me comentaba ahorita en la comida es que a él le gustaría mucho empezar tal vez a hacer una presentación como de una hora, después que hagamos un pequeño break para tomar si quieren un café de 10 minutos y regresar a tratar ya como de armar una especie de seminario en donde este, podamos discutir un poquito este, bueno, pues, qué es lo que cada quien está trabajando y cómo las investigaciones desde las ciencias evolutivas y de la, las neurociencias eh, se puede vincular también con lo que cada quien esté haciendo. En el seminario anterior habíamos hecho una sesión rápida de presentación, la voy a evitar porque hoy tenemos dos horas nada más, habíamos este, contemplado tres en la última vez, pero ahorita nada más tenemos dos horas y entonces sí quisiera aprovechar el tiempo que está el profesor de CETI con nosotros y si quieren ya en el momento que este, tengan alguna participación y quieren decirnos rápidamente su nombre y de dónde vienen, nada más para que tengamos este conocimiento todos y nos vayamos conociendo, creo que así lo podemos, lo podemos dejar, ¿les parece bien? Entonces para ya no alargar más, 
más eh, eh, este tiempo, le voy a dar la palabra al doctor De Seti, que este, va a, a ver con nosotros el día de hoy este, la relación que existe entre los prejuicios grupales, los sesgos cognitivos y, este, y bueno, desde las, de la teoría evolutiva y las neurociencias sociales. Entonces, eh, profesor De Seti, once more, thank you very much for being here this afternoon. And please okay. go ahead. So, um, woo. Can you hear me, the young ladies in the back? And thank you for doing the translation. I'm pretty sure it's not easy for you. You're doing the real work. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is a seminar. So I know Alexandra wants me to speak for one hour, but I first, what I have, what I have prepared is way, be, be, uh, you know, too long. It doesn't matter. We can pick some aspects of this presentation, but I don't feel really like going to give you a second talk. Why? Because I'm tired. <laughs> you are tired. W listening to one person speaking for hours, it's not good. And also, you know, I'm in education. I'm a professor first and foremost. And we've learned from, from research in education that we should never do what I was going to do, which is like speaking, like lecturing. And I know that uh, uh, that's what people do, and I, that's what I do too. But it's probably the worst way for you to learn, it's to listen. We've learned that. It's, isn't it interesting that despite the fact that we've learned from the science of education that teaching the way I did this morning and I was going to do it again today in the afternoon is not the efficient way for students to learn. So why should I do it? Ah. So I want you to participate, right? I'm prepared. I work very, very hard. It's not I'm lazy. I'm not lazy. I work seven days a week. I take no vacation in during the year because I love my work. I did take vacation when my kids were young, but not anymore. So it's not I'm lazy, and I promise I prepared this seminar for weeks it's here. It's even all written up could give it to the young lady to translate, it's going to be easier. So it's very easy for me to go into the slideshow to some very specific parts so we can discuss. But I want you to be active today, not just listening to, oh, what do I say? And the first thing I'm going to teach, the way we teach in the US, right? It's very dynamic. So the first thing I'm going to do, please be very short, I'm going to ask you to tell me your name and what you do. I don't want you to tell me like tw 20 minutes of your life. Tell me my name is whatever, John, and I'm an economist. Or this is Peter, I'm a neurologist. That's all I want to know. I want to know your name and your profession. If you are a student, just tell me what you study. Okay? Be brief. I want your name and, you, and what you study or what you teach. That's it. Miss, you start with you. I want to know who you are. Do it the American way. Okay. Right? Good. I don't need translation. No translation. I can get that. Okay. No, I don't need it. I'm good enough. Can you say your name and what you do, please, sir? In, in Spanish, it's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pedro Rodríguez, soy parte de la Fundación Ser de Paz. Patricia Santaella, psicóloga y del proyecto Incides, Interacciones sin Discriminación. Jaime Rivera, editor de libros. Buenas tardes, soy Héctor Zúñiga Vargas, trabajo en la Ciudad de México, en el gobierno de la Ciudad de México en la red de transportes de pasajeros y estoy estudiando la licenciatura en Derecho aquí en la UNAM, en la di División a Distancia. Gracias. Uh, soy Axel Fernández, eh, estoy estudiando la maestría en Filosofía. Mi nombre es Abigail Valentín y soy psicóloga. Eh, yo soy Juliana, estudiante de maestría en Finanzas y de profesión economista. Economía, ok. 
Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Rafael Arellano y también soy estudiante de la licenciatura en Derecho. Hola, soy Carla Hinojosa y soy abogada. Hola, Isis Gómez y estudio Psicología. Hola, soy Lucero y soy estudiante de maestría. Soy Mónica y yo soy psicóloga. Buenas tardes, soy Patricia Durán, soy maestra de educación preescolar y socióloga. Buenas tardes, soy Argelia, Argelia Ibarra y soy psicóloga. Buenas tardes, yo soy Margarita y soy politóloga. Ya, 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 eh, hola, yo soy Cinci y soy internacionalista. Soy José Manuel y soy psicólogo. Claudia, estudiante de doctorado en ciencias sociales y trabajo en prisiones. Marta, international finance coaching, uh, teacher and simultaneous translation. Nice. Jessica, y soy estudiante de derecho. Everybody knows her. And you know me. Uh, Verónica, estudiante de estudios legales. Okay. Soy Doris, soy abogada y maestra en saberes sobre subjetividad y violencia. Mi nombre es Valdomero, estudiante de Derecho. Mi nombre es Libertad, estudiante del doctorado en Psicología aquí en la UNAM. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Víctor, eh, soy psicólogo y trabajo para Juno Odyssey. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Alicia Ortiz, soy socióloga y psicoterapeuta, eh, tengo el doctorado por la Facultad de Ciencias Políticas y doy clases ahí en la facultad. Flor, soy académica, investigadora, operadora jurídica y tengo unos estudios en finanzas. Thank you very much, everybody. So, I think it's, so you know, there is a few economists, a few, are we missing someone? Miss, who are you? Tell me, tell me your name and what you do. Yeah, she said we we missed her. No. 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 So we're okay. Sí, we're okay. We're okay. Bueno, Gil, ¿qué ah, <laughs> Gilberto Martínez, el trabajo en el Hub en Derechos Humanos, sociólogo. Okay, so I, you know what I've just learned for myself. So it's it's good because then I can tweak my uh, discussion with you. Is that most of you are from psychology, right? There is a few an economist, a few sociologists, political science, quite a few. But massively, you guys are from psychology. I didn't ask you, I don't want to go again on the table. We can do that forever. It's pretty cool. Uh, what, when you say psychology, is it massively cognitive psychology? Or, you know, because psychology has different uh, branches. I don't know, in Mexico, I'm hoping it's not psychoanalysis. <laughs> I can be provocative, right? It's, no, but it's. Social psychology. Oh, cool. That's cool. It's so I guess it depends. But clinic and social okay. psychology. Okay. Uh, is clinical psychology psychoanalysis? Still? Psychoanalysis is one. Well, I should say psychology. All right. Say, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, so. So, anyway, so I know this, even this morning in the questions, I know from my communication with Alexandra, and I know from the website, her work, and the, the and, and you know, whatever, what I know from, from this institute here, is that lots of you are really interested and in working on this notion of biases. That's correct, biases. So let me ask you, not everybody, because otherwise, too much. When you say biases, how anyone wants to jump and tell us what is a bias for you? Not w 20 minutes, like one sentence. What is a bias? That's the first thing. Yeah. Okay. I, got, I don't need translation. I'm, I'm, I can pick up that. Anyone wants to? So it's about values? Yeah, tell me. A bias. Okay. And I give what? Okay. Listen. If you speak now, I want to hear something different from these two. I'm not sure I understood that, but. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. One more? You want to go? Yeah, please. Helping. So attaches a special mental um, shortcut to when you are going to make a decision. High five. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I'm not saying that you're correct, they are wrong, they are correct, you're wrong, whatever. As you can tell immediately just now here, all right, we have only two hours. All of us, we have very different definitions of biases, what, what they are, right? So we and it makes sense. We come from different backgrounds, whether it's sociology or e economics, political sciences, biology, whatever. Uh, and we have different views or definitions of w cognitive biases. But uh, do we have a question for you? It's a question. Do you agree that we're going to discuss today what we call cognitive biases? That's what you want for me. And again, I'm not an expert. Maybe you're more than me, right? So that's why I don't want here to be giving a lecture, right? This is boring for you, right? It's more like I want to be with you and together, as I said this morning, together try to see whether when we discuss these cognitive biases, what they are, where they are from, what their functions, uh, we can grow our knowledge. Whether you agree with me or not, doesn't matter. As long as whatever we discuss this afternoon can bring something in your mind. I was sitting to Alexandra over lunch, if I may, it's a seminar, right? So over lunch, I said to Alexandra this, I think, I said, I don't think I'm very smart, because I'm sure everybody's very smart here, very intelligent. If you are in academia, it means your IQ is probably 120, right? We know IQ. I can talk about IQ if you want. IQ is very important. It's 50% genetics, right? People don't like IQ, but it does exist. IQ is a very good measure of intelligence. It's not the best one. It's not perfect. Oh, no. It's a very accurate measure of intelligence. And IQ is predictive of many, many things in your life. Your economic success, your health, and so forth. So people say, you know, IQ is bad, it's cultural. That's not true. IQ is very precise. Again, it's not perfect. It has a lot of flaws, whatever you want. But IQs are very precise and predictive of many outcomes in our life. Back to academia, everybody who goes to academia, whether you are in Mexico or in Chicago, it's the same. We know, I don't need to do an IQ test on any of us. We know that statistically, most of us, like the bell curve, which is like 88% of the people in this room, you have an IQ above 120. That's why you're here. You're not a cab driver. doesn't mean the cab driver are stupid. Some of them have a uh, very high IQ, but you have a higher IQ for, for much of them. Okay. So I was saying to uh, Alexandra, I don't think I'm very smart, smarter than you are, certainly not. But there is one thing I really like about the way I look at and think about science and academia and my work, whether it's my work with psychopaths, children, or like when I'm here with you, is that I value, talk about value, contradictions. I value argumentations. That's from my origin in my family. So if you study human rights, as I know Alexandra does, the first thing I would say you should do, maybe you do it, by the way, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to give advice, is you need to read people who are against human rights. If you just read people who are like you, you know, we want human rights, it's so important. It's the French Declaration or whatever, the US or whatever. It's important. I'm not saying it's not important. But what you really need to, to do if you want to grow your knowledge, it's to read the people who are against you. So what I'm just saying is that whatever I'm going to tell you about cognitive biases, if you disagree, fine. That's very good. If you want to argue with me, even better, as long as, oh, there is a reason there. You can argue, criticize anything I say. That's good. As long as what you criticize is based on evidence, 
not ideology. That's harder. So that's what we teach in college in, Chicago, in the US. We want to teach our students to criticize anything we say, the paper, the study, the design. But it has to be based on evidence. I don't want someone to come and say, me, you know, oh, there is no, say, there's some, so it happens today. So sometimes you have students today, more and more, it's, you're going to come in Mexico and say, there is no gender differences in the mind. Okay? And there are people like that today. They will come and see me, and if I teach a class about sex differences in the brain, which I do sometimes, I have a class on that, the other student will say, this does not exist. So they look and say, really? Okay. I'm not saying that men are more intelligent than women. It's probably the, the reverse, by the way. Uh, I'm not saying that you know, men are, are superior to female. Let's say female because I'm a biologist, as, as you know now. I'm just saying that is there evidence that there are or not gender differences in the brain? Look at you, you at your body. I can just look at your face. It takes 40 milliseconds, that's science. It takes 40 milliseconds in the brain, 40 milliseconds, just to look at the face and say female, male. Babies do that, babies. It's not cultural learning. Babies in the crib, there are studies. I can show you that babies can distinguish between male and female faces at three months of age. So just looking at a face, you're a female, he's a male. And I know there are people who are in between, fine. But most of us, we are male or female. Male generally have a larger torso than female. They are stronger here than female. Is that good or bad? Doesn't matter. It's a fact. So you could come and say, you know, sure, that's okay for the body. There are differences in body. Female have boobs, we don't, okay? But when it comes to psychology, there is no differences in the, in the mind between, brain and, and, uh, between men and female. If they are, because they are, we know, it's coming from education and culture. That's true, absolutely. That's true that education and culture can reinforce or place stereotypes on men and female, sure. But I want to bring evidence, not today, as an example, that to my class that Let's do the research, let's look at the research, that there is research, maybe it's not good, maybe it's wrong, we should criticize. There, are, there is research that shows there are male, female differences in the brain. And maybe the research is bad, you can criticize, you can say it's bad research, but bring arguments, don't tell me, no, doesn't exist, why? Oh, because I don't want that to happen. So we're gonna do the same. So cognitive biases, I just wanna say, so usually, I don't know if you accept that, but for, for me, for me, for what I study at least, maybe it's different from you, um, it's like an umbrella term that refers to the systematic ways in which the context and framing of information, information influence individual judgment and decision making. You see? Very different, very different from you. It's about the information that you get and how does that influence your judgment and decision making, right? That is what we call biases. They are cognitive because they play a role into our judgment and decision making process. You okay with that definition? It's very scientific, right? So biases, they are very important because they very often deviate from rational objectivity and make our thinking and decision making faster and more efficient. And of course they can be wrong. That's the problem. We're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna give you an example. I continue on my definitions. The reason is that when we think and behave and co co collaborate, we do not stop to consider all available information as our thoughts proceed down some channels, I hope the translation can read, instead of others. In other cases, however, 
cognitive biases can lead to error. We can make big mistakes. And I will give you a concrete example, right? For the same reason, okay? So cognitive bias, they are important because they play a role in information design because they influence decision-making processes and that's true, including for uh, how we buy stuff here. Economists, where are the economists, right? If you are in business, don't you know that you can you can play with the, with the price, just put 3.99, it looks better than four, 3.99, who cares about one cent? Why do we do that? Because it's a bias. If I look at the price 3.99, it looks cheaper than four, just for one dollar, uh, one cent. You see, it's not very rational, but it's pretty quick. And we know it, we use it all the time. Okay, so there are many biases, many. There is one you know, I'm sure, and then we're going to talk about group biases, I promise, only that. So one of the biases, I'm sure you know it, it's very well known, it's called the confirmation bias. This is the tendency that we do have to interpret new evidence as confirmation of what we already know and believe. So you read a newspaper, okay, take a, you know, I don't know where you are on the political spectrum, it doesn't matter, but it's very unlikely that if you are Democrat or uh, on the left, you're gonna read newspaper from the right. But it's the same from the people from the right. They don't read newspaper from the left. We all do the same. Because when I read the newspaper in the morning, I'm gonna read the newspaper that fits my own beliefs. And I believe that, oh, you know, New York Times, that's the best newspaper. Why? Maybe not. That's a bias. It is a bias, right? People on the left in the US, they read the New York Times. I read the Economist, by the way. I don't read the New York Times. Well, but maybe I have a bias. I believe that The Economist is a very good newspaper because it fits w my vision of the world. That's true for everything. You agree? We tend to look at information that already confirm what we know and believe. That's a bias. And we all do that. Don't tell me you don't do it. So don't tell me biases are for the other, not for me. All of us here, we have all these biases. And the thing that should make us very modest is that even when you know about these biases, it's still very hard to reduce. It's very hard, right? If you think that, I don't know, Muslims are bad people? Sure. You can say, oh, I know one Muslim is a good person, but you have these biases against Muslims. And maybe there is a reason for that. Who knows, right? There is values in, in this reason. Okay, so that's one of them. The other one uh, uh, is, I'm sure, it's called the availability heuristics. You know this bias? The judgment, in that case, this is another bias as an example, where judgment is made on salience of the information held in memory about a particular event. That's called the availability heuristic. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if I ask people in the US, which, it's here, it's in the slide. If I ask people in the US, and only Mexico, but in the US, which job is more dangerous? Being a police officer, as you know, it's very dangerous in Chicago. People shoot all the time, they have guns. Lots of people kill. In Chicago, where I live, we have 700 people shot dead every year in the city, inside the city. Mostly gang people shooting at each other for drugs. They don't shoot at me. When they see me, they don't, they don't care. 700. So if you're a police officer in Chicago, you can be shot, I promise. So it's very dangerous. But what about loggers, right? Loggers, they work in the forest, they cut the trees. Which one? So if you ask people in the US, they will tell you because of this bias that it is more dangerous to be a police officer than a logger. But now, that's what you think, because that's what you have in your memory. If you live in Chicago or in St. Louis, not in New York, New York is much safer now, but you, 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 that's what you think. Makes sense because of this bias. And it's a good bias to have. But in fact, if you look at the data, you can go online. There are data for about everything today. 
being a logger is way more dangerous. You're more likely to be killed. Being a logger and work in Oregon or in Washington State cutting trees, you're much more likely to be killed on the job than to be a police officer. Just look at the sheer numbers. How many people are killed every year when they are in the logging industry or in the police forces? And you'll see. Okay? I'll give you one more example. It's very provocative, and I'm sure some people will not like it, but that's, I don't care. It's science. So in the U.S., most people on the left believe, or Democrats, because it's left and right, it's not the same, that police officers are biased against black people. Uh, probably it's true. Okay? They also say that being a black person, you are more likely to be shot by a white police officer than if it were a black police officer. Okay? That's a bias. Why? Because if you look at the data, and then I, when I say that because a study was published a month ago in PNS, one of the best journals in science, proceeding of the National Academy of Science, PNAS, and they did a study. They look at all the data in the US in, 19, in 2016 and 17, how many people were shot across all states, who shot black or white police officer, who is the person who was shot, black or white. They did the statistics. That's not true. The, sh the study showed that that's not true. This is a bias. The, 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 the evidence doesn't show that you're more likely to be shot as a black person by a white police officer. It's not true. It's the same. Black or white will be exactly the same. But that's what people think. Or maybe you can come and say, you know, I disagree with the study. That's fine. It's where you can criticize. Say, oh, let me look at the study. They did not control for that. The statistics are not good. Make people make error. That's fine. But you see, that's good sometimes to look at data, not just thinking. Okay, so let's move. Or, you know, like confirmation bias. Let me give you an, an example of the first one. How many people not here? We're not going to raise your hand because there are more female than male. But how many people think that women are worse drivers than male? Well, you can say that's the stereotype. It is a stereotype. Is it true? Because maybe stereotypes are not wrong. It's nothing bad to say there are stereotypes. If I go to Spain, I would say that I have the stereotypes that Spanish, Spaniard, they take a siesta after lunch. I don't. They do. My stereotype of people in Spain is that they take a long lunch break. That's true. So the stereotype is pretty accurate to me. And I can tell you, you know, people in the U.S. drink a lot of beer. And French, they drink a lot of whiskey. You know that? I've learned that. The, the, the people who drink the most whiskey in the world are the French, not the British. That's new. I didn't know that. I look at the data. Interesting. Okay. So confirmation bias. So if you see someone, a woman, having a car accident, you know, sure, I knew it. She's a female. She's not a good driver. But that's not necessarily true. And then you can look at the data and see how many females have a car accident. Are they more dangerous than male? You may be surprised. Okay. So look, this is a, a map. I'm happy to send it to you if, if you are interested because it's way, way too small for you. But again, if you want it, just send me an email. I'm happy to send you the slide. But this is a map that someone, I don't know who did that, but it's pretty cool. I wish I could go next to the screen. But this is a map that has all the cognitive biases we have. Can you imagine? So many, all. And they are all organized into memory, perception, decision-making. Look at so many. Can you see all of them? So I'm not going to go to each of those, but it shows you that there is an industry of research thanks to behavioral economics. That's because of her, them. Be so cognitive biases became really at the forefront of academic research because of, help me, big name. I want a big name. Someone who got the Nobel Prize for that? Kahneman. Kahneman. Danny Kahneman and his fellow Israeli colleague who died before the Nobel Prize, Amos Trevsky. 
So those two people, two Israeli Americans, were working together as economists, and they were psychologists and economists both, and they worked a lot on cognitive biases. And Danny Kahneman and Amos Trevsky got the Nobel Prize for that. But then it exploded, right? Look at this, Omicron. Okay. Okay, so biases, there is one way to look at them. We call them also heuristics. They are very simple. Women don't drive well. Whether that's true or false, that's something else. Very, very quick. Simple, approximate, very dirty, efficient, very quick, rule that have been learned or hard-coded by evolutionary processes. You see? That's the definition I gave you this morning. That's the definition. Many of our decision biases that we have, error or misjudgment, that's maybe that's new to you, I don't know, maybe provocative, are not necessarily flaws. Right? They are, that's what I'm going to tell you about group biases. These biases are in fact designed by features that natural selection has endowed homo sapiens to make decisions in ways that consistently enhance our ancestor inclusive fitness. That's why we have many of these biases. That seems strange, because I'm pretty sure I don't want to ask again. We don't have the time. But for many people, when we talk about biases, it seems something bad. It's negative. Do you agree? Yeah. You agree with me? Most of you, when you say, oh, he has a bias against women, against black, against poor, against the rich, against whatever, against the police, those are not positive. It's usually negative. Do you agree? Or not? Someone disagree with that? That's what I'm sure what's most people. So that probably is the surprising aspect of the seminar. I'm going to tell you that, yeah, they may be bad, but they were good to some extent for a long time. Okay? And please, you stop me anytime you want. Okay. So before we go to one specific kind of biases, group biases, I just want to remind you a few uh, aspect about when we talk about evolution, right? Otherwise, it goes everywhere. Uh, let's see if I have it here, so I don't, I, I don't, because it's way too far for me. Um, yeah, evolution of life, what it is. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, you do make yourself clear, uh, but um, I do believe that they are all cognitive biases because you read what fits your beliefs. People, you know, listen to their church. They don't listen to the other religion, right? Only academics do that. Um, when I talk about uh, prejudice, that's, we're going to talk about prejudices, but no, we are not there yet. The bias is whether when I'm a black cop, when I see a, 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 a black person, do I have a very quick decision making, which is like black people are more dangerous. That's a bias. That's a bias. That's a bias. That's a bias. It's not based on reason. See, I see a black person in the street, 
and I feel that as a threat. That's not a prejudice. That's, it's a bias. I'm just saying, is that true or not? It may be true. That's a bias. It means that it makes your decision-making mechanism very quick. I see black, threat, white, no threat. And I have to make a very quick decision. Right? So we're going to talk about all of that in a moment. So uh, keep with me. Let's go to evolution of life. I just want to remind what it is because I'm just making the case, including when we're going to talk about stereotypes, prejudice, black and white, whatever, racism, what you call racism, which I won't talk about racism. I think they are biases. They are based on biases and they are not necessari necessarily bad things. That's, I know, let me go there. But to understand that, I just want to remind you when we talk about evolution, evolution is basically the result of a process, as it's in the slide, um, who, whereby different forms like genes compete, they compete to harvest energy from the environment and convert this energy into replicates of those forms. Right? That's what evolution biology is. Individuals, when I say individual, need to capture energy from the envir environment, energy, food, if you want, right? For example, f foraging, hunting, cultivating, and allocate this energy to reproduction and survival activities. When I say individual, that's humans, it's bacteria. Any human, uh, sorry, any living organism follow the same rules. Those are the rules of evolution. You too. You believe that you are not in evolution. No, you do compete for resources. You need to eat. You need to reproduce. Some of us don't do it too much. Some of us do too much of it. But that's what evolution is. And you are not aware of it. I told you this morning, we are not aware of this. That's the way we are. And selection, natural selection, will favor individuals who efficiently capture energy and effectively allocate this energy to enhance fitness. That's all it is about. And there is no value judgment. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's what evolution is. And that's true for us humans. Okay? So let's go back to the bias. That's very important to understand. Um, I'm just going to focus on one because we don't have much time. Group biases. Because I'm, I'm interested in group biases in what I do, too. So what I want to tell you now, I'm going to show you a lot of research. And again, as you did, sir, with a blue t-shirt, you, please stop me. If you disagree with me, that's good. Say, sorry, I don't understand what you say. I disagree. I love it. So group biases. We're going to focus on that. I want to show you that our brain, when I say brain, your mind, the same. I don't, I don't make this in distinction between the mind and the brain. It's the same thing. The brain we have can distinguish between in-group members and outsider in a fraction of a second. Do you know that? You knew it? It takes a fraction of a second. And like what I told you this morning, it's very flexible. So don't tell me, yeah, that's the basis of racism. No, 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 no. I'm not at this level. Let, let me give you some very precise example. Okay? First, what you can do is you can tell me, yeah, you know, it's because of our culture. Right? We go to school and we live in communities and in families. And we learn that, you know, we are the best. The next village are not so good. We are so smart, the other are lazy, the white people are nicer than the black, all this kind of crap. Sure. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Yeah, th th I'm not interested in that. That's obvious. That's obvious. If in your culture you keep saying that these people are not bad, uh, sorry, they are filthy, they are stupid, they are lazy. Okay, makes sense. I don't think you need science for that. You don't need to have me here today or you to study that. That's, it's kind of like trivial. But that's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is that these biases, nothing bad. The biases by which, or, or biases, you see, it's not negative. 
this capacity that we have, say, in group, out group. Are automatic, automatic, unconscious. You're not even aware of it. I can tell you how we know that. You're not even aware. These biases or heuristics, I like heuristic because you know what? Heuristics has no negative connotation, right? And that's why I strongly believe that, I don't know what you think, Alexandra, that machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's very good for the future of humankind. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of that. Yeah, I'm kind of afraid that robots will take our jobs, for sure. We'll do something else. Maybe the robots can do the mining. Who wants to go in the mine? I don't know, they'll be here today than being in the mine. I'm not afraid of robots, and I'm even less afraid of artificial, artificial intelligence. Because we can program our machine learning and our computers to be very smart and not to have biases. Huh. But you have biases because they're automatic and unconscious. These biases, they emerge very, very early in life. Even babies show these biases for in-group, out-group. Babies. And don't tell me the babies have group biases because of their mother. No. <coughs> Those of you who are parents, you know it. When your baby was like eight months old, you didn't teach your baby, you know, you're the best and the other baby is bad because he's black. Nobody does that. And yet, they have biases. Uh, these biases, they problem because sometimes they encourage us to be kind to the in-group and at times, not always, hostile to the art group. And that you can see very early in young children. And this is not due to education and culture. But that's the thing. These biases, they have a functional role. And, and they are free. And they are fluid, uh, flexible. And we think that today's them can become tomorrow's us, remember? And so that's why I'm not negative. We have biases in group, out group, but the way we categorize people is very flexible. I'm gonna give you a lot of examples, talking about cooperation, right? It's not based on skin color, language. It can be based on many other things. So it's flexible. And I will give you some examples to show you that it's not necessarily a negative thing, right? Is it too much? Yes. That would be the outcome of a bias. No, the, the, what you describe is not a bias in self, but before, this is the heuristics. Yes. Let me just uh, get in here. Eh, yo, yo creo que el, el problema es que creo que no tienes muy claro el concepto de sesgo cognitivo. Entonces creo que estás tratando de utilizarlo como un concepto, digamos, para tratar de interpretar otros elementos en los que no necesariamente estamos trabajando ahorita. Las políticas económicas, yo creo que te, podríamos hacer un análisis desde muchas perspectivas y creo que no necesariamente tiene que ver con sesgos cognitivos. Eh, 
es que yo creo que no tienes como muy claro el concepto de sesgo cognitivo, entonces lo que yo te propondría es que dejemos que avance un poquito más la presentación ¿no? y, este, y a partir de eso veamos, ¿no? o sea, creo que es interesante hacer preguntas cuando ya se redondeó un poco este, la presentación este, de los elementos que nos quiere dar y a partir de eso creo que podemos retomar las preguntas, ¿te parece bien? Lo único que te diría es, eh, eh, o sea, espérate tantito, creo que tienes que aclarar bien lo que significa el sesgo cognitivo, porque sí creo que lo estás mal interpretando. No, no, no tienen que ver con eso, por eso lo que yo te diría es, dejemos que el profesor de SETI avance Perfecto. con su presentación, ¿ok? Y si quieres al final ya redondeamos un poquito, ¿sí? Okay, I'm, I'm going back, maybe I should send you the, some of the slides, maybe up there. So I'm going back to the first one, because this is not my definition. This is the definition I take from Kahneman and all the cognitive psychologists and economists who teach about cognitive biases. So I'm not, you may disagree, but again, come back with argument. Most people, at least that I know, who study cognitive biases has cognitive psychology that could what they do. Biases are not studied by sociologists, no or clinicals. So we use, we have to be careful. You guys, some of you, you use this word, but they are not the way we use them in our profession. Mm -hmm. So cognitive biases, this is what it is. You may disagree, but you're not talking like, being a nation is not a bias. You were born in Mexico, it's not a bias. The bias is like, groups have bias against our group for good reasons. It makes information, Read the first one. Second, it's, li it's, it's lead to decisions that deviate from rationality, and it's the systematic ways in which the context of framing information influences decision making. It's all about decision making. All about decision making. It's not about prejudice and zero. That's something else. It can lead to that. But I'm not there. I'm talking about the mechanisms. It's totally like, it should not be even an issue. It's not like being good or bad, it's, it's the way we are very efficient. So let's go back, okay? So I give you some examples, many exist. And so why do we have, there is always a reason. What I try to tell you is that cognitive biases, all of them, but specifically the one we're gonna discuss for the next hour, group biases, they have a function. It's not something you learn. You can learn to reduce your biases, maybe, but the fact we have mechanisms that lead us to favor in group are due to a function, right? That's what I'm trying to say. And why, what it is, it's again back to evolutionary theory. There is a huge benefit huge benefit to live in groups, right? When we live in groups, you live in groups. Uh, it's critical for surviving and reproduction. Living in group, groups provides a buffer against hostile environments. It facilitates access to resources, food, mates, communal parental care that are essential for reproductive success. It facil living in groups facilitates cooperation and division of labor that's very efficient, right? And it has foraging benefits in detecting food sources, protecting food sources against competitors. This, what I say here, it is, can be applied to any species. The bees, the ants, the meerkats, the chimpanzees, the rats, and us. That's true for everybody. That's why we live in groups. Groups has evolved in evolution because it makes the member of the group more competitive, at the same time, more likely to survive. That's why. See? But it's a good, th it's a good thing, the of evolution. There are costs always, as I said this morning, there is no free lunch in evolution. There are always benefits and costs. And if you're an economist, you know that there's always this equa equation, risk, benefits, and cost. We do that all the time. 
and we are very good at that in our brain, and many of our biases are, in fact, shortcuts to go to the benefits. So when we live in groups, there are also costs. Sharing food, that's within group competition. Larger groups are usually spread out across larger area, and it makes it easier for a predator to find and detect larger groups. It increases likelihood to be of being infected with parasites and pathogen. And if you live in groups, there is more competition for mates within the group too. Okay, so that's basic evolutionary theory. As a consequence, humans, we have evolved a range of psychological mechanisms that promote an attraction and capacity for living in groups, right? Because our fitness depends on sharing resources with people you trust, sharing with people you are likely to reciprocate, and identifying, avoiding non-reciprocator. You see? So all you see, those are mechanisms that have evolved in humans because we live in groups. I think it's positive. It makes people more likely to survive. You like it or not, that's a fact. So you, that's important for us. If you want people to cooperate, well, they need to trust each other. Why should I cooperate with you? That's a problem today because we cooperate at very large scale. We do business with China, with Mexico, right? How much of stuff come from Mexico to the US? How much come from the US to Mexico? We never see each other. It's all meant online. Right? Some of that we send our lawyers to talk to each other. Politicians, they talk. But it, you trust me. Alexandra trusted me. It's very simple. She said, you know, Jean, I invite you. I pay your online ticket. Would you like to come? She had to trust me. Because I could say, you know, pay my online ticket. I will never show up. There is trust. So that's one thing you need to understand. It's so important to teach if you want to have cohesive groups working together. The first thing is that you need trust. People need to trust each other, right? Second thing that we learned just from this definition is that you need to have people who can reciprocate. Reciprocate means that I give you something today, it's unconscious. I anticipate something in return. So if I'm nice to you, I understand that you will be nice to me in return. And I'm sure you will. Again, most people are good people. They are not stupid, right? So you're more likely to cooperate, to be nice to your in-group members because you trust them and you know they are likely to reciprocate. Why should I be nice to people in Somalia? Why? Because out of charity? Sure. But that's not what evolution is about. I'm going to be nice. I'm not saying that you should not be nice to people in Somalia, but it's not the same as being nice to your own people in your country or in your own city. I don't think that's very hard to, ima to understand. Okay. Yes. Yes. And we are, thank you, and we are very good at detecting who is cheating. Yes. As you know, we have this mechanism in the brain to detect cheaters. There are people who take advantage, always. Always. It's part of human nature. Right? If we were always nice all the time, why do we need to have a police forces? Why do we need to have a criminal justice system? We don't need any of those. We are so nice. That's the view of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But that's not the way it is. So people, you know, always try to take advantage. So you need to trust the people you want to work with and be careful that they don't cheat in the interaction. And there's a lot of work in uh, behavioral economics when we use public games, uh, the dictator game, ultimatum games, all these games in economics that shows that we will punish people who cheat. We will punish at cost to ourselves. We call that altruistic punishment. You will punish someone who is cheating on someone else. We don't like that. There are people who are cheating. Maybe I cheat sometimes too. That's the way we are. Okay. Um, I think there was another question here. Querías preguntar algo, no? Alzaste la mano?
Si vemos que es alguien confiable. Bueno, ah, ok. Si vemos que es alguien confiable, eh, vamos por su reputación, vamos a apoyarlo, no vamos a ser empáticos. Entonces, si vemos que es una persona que toma, pues es desleal, pues tal vez, como dice, va a ser ostracismo. Y desde la, bueno, desde las matemáticas están haciendo estas investigaciones de reputación social, ¿no? Como eso también nos ayuda. Tal vez ser buenos tal vez también es un mecanismo biológico ¿no? para tener ayuda en los grupos. Bueno, eso es lo que dicen las investigaciones. Y otra cosa, bueno, por ejemplo, ¿cómo funcionan los sesgos en las personas con esquizofrenia o con algún trastorno? Porque también tendrían sesgos como nosotros o ellos son más personalizados. Como más, mm, por ejemplo, tengo un paciente que relaciona, que, está, que odia a Trump porque quiere matar a los mexicanos. Entonces, cada vez que ve un mapa de Estados Unidos lo rompe. Pero, ¿eso es un parte de un sesgo o eso es mi duda? No. Ok, thank you so much. So, we have to move and I have to be very clear. I'm sorry if I, if I sound blunt and aggressive. I'm not aggressive. That. So, whatever I discussed today with you has nothing, nothing ever to do with schizophrenia, psychiatry. Although I'm in psychiatry, it has nothing to do. Schizophrenic patients are patient. They are all factored up to make it simple. So, we will never use anything about biases with patients. That's, it's bizarre. This is like people who are abnormal. Uh, we have to respect them, care for them, treat them, whatever you want, but we don't talk about schizophrenia at all. No, no, that's nothing to do with that. And then empathy, uh, I don't think I will even use the word empathy. I don't think empathy has anything to do with what I discussed so far. I think reputation, yes, but that's not empathy. Empathy is like, I see you in pain, I want to help you. And if she's my mother or my daughter, I'm more likely to do it. My girlfriend, for sure, someone from my village. Even if you don't me give, give me back anything, I see you, I know you, I like you, I'm going to help you. That's empathy. That's, that, yeah, and you go, you're going to have more empathy for your in-group than the on-group, for sure. But this, yeah, but reputation is something else. Okay, so I want to move. So for a long time, look at this beautiful picture. It's, a, it's not a picture, of course, but who knows. You know, I just want to remind you for a long, long time during our history, this is where we lived. I don't know if you, I mean, I'm a biologist by training, so I love this kind of knowledge. I just want to remind you, and I'm going to do it in the few uh, next slides, that for most of our species history as homo sapiens, we lived in the savannah in Africa, not in Mexico. That's very recent, very recent. At the scale of evolution, and I'm going to tell you exactly when, we were not here. Nobody was here. Nobody. No Indians, no Aztec, no Maya. Nobody was here. Humankind started in Africa. And for a very long time, we lived in small groups in the savannah. That's very important for the continuation, right? We live in very small social groups that were very often in conflict with other groups and it was evolutionary functional for them to view members of, of other groups as different and potentially dangerous. Don't be naive. It means that I feel safe in my small, not village, it's my small clique group in the savannah because I know everybody. We live in small groups. I know everybody. I know your name. I know who is your mother. I know you. We were living in small groups, like 50. Above like 50, 60, let's say above 80, it's very hard to keep track who is whom, which is the case today. That's the problem. But for a long time, we lived in a small group where everybody knew each other. And then if you go over the hill, right? Over the hill, I don't know. They don't speak the same language. Oh, they look the same. Everybody was black. And they might kill me. So this is the other, that's us, that's them. And you better make the distinction if you want to survive. If you are naive enough saying, oh, I'm going to go, everybody's nice in the world, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you won't be here today. You will not survive, okay? And so, as I said here in the slide, differentiating between us and them helped keep us safe and free from diseases, right? 
and that has led people to prefer people who are like them and in some cases to sometimes unfortunately unfairly reject people who are not like them but being close to your in group it's good to survive there's nothing wrong with that right and i'm going to tell you at that at the end of the seminar if i have the time is that maybe it's going to be more than two hours but if you want to make people cooperate together you know don't again as i said this morning don't use shame don't say you know it's bad to reject people who are not like you no it's a natural tendency don't shame people you will not change their mind this way there are ways to make people work together beyond in group out group and i'm going to give you some very concrete example from soccer formula one race and the army three examples very concrete okay just bear with me okay so again back to a little from uh, political philosophy this is political philosophy do you remember for a long long time we had two opposite views of human societies and they are both very interesting to study one is that from thomas hobbes right he was living in the uk it was not called the uk by the way and for hobbes which is huge huge name you should read his work the leviathan very important for thomas hobbes human beings are by nature selfish and belligerent they are nasty so what he wants he wants us humans to come together and to create a powerful state institutions to suppress aggression and that's what we do he is correct that's true that's what we need government we need justice lawyers and cops jean-jacques rousseau had a very different view as you see that's a quote for jean-jacques oh jean-jacques i know him for rousseau sorry human beings are by nature solitary which is stupid by the way that's not true and peaceful and they become not peaceful because of society it's societies you know everybody when you are like a young kid by nature you're such you're an angel you're so nice and if you become nasty aggressive it's because of the society okay that's very two different views right Hobbes said no by nature we are nasty so we need to control we need more control and Rousseau says just the opposite right both are true but both are wrong right in fact there is little truth in either vision of of early human societies right what we believe today based on science is that our tribal past in the past when we were all living in africa included both intense cooperation within groups trade and peace as well as frequent aggression for murder looting abduction both within and across groups so it's not really true that in the past when we were living in the savannah we were so nice and now we are so bad because we have the cartels and that stuff that's not true that's not true we were bad in the past as well it's part of who we are so the main error of both visions is to think that humans are driven by sort of unconditional inflexible instinct towards war or peace it's as if we have that it's unconditional that's not true okay it's just the opposite what makes humans go to war or to cooperate it's not stable it's not general and it's context it's context free preferences for aggression or for peace but in fact it is a set of mechanisms that will you see decision making the mechanism will weigh the value of either strategy fight or cooperate in the current environment so each of us in our mind we have these mechanisms decision decision making mechanisms that we use very quickly and you can help people you can help people you can sway people to go to war 
or to go to peace, right? But you have to speak to their decision mechanism. It's not an instinct. There is very little instinct, in fact. And in psychology today, we don't even use the word. When I teach social neuroscience, I never use the word reflex or instinct. Reflex for sure, right? You know the reflex, if I do that, get this loop, I need jerk reflex. Those are reflexes, right? Because I'm gonna, I'm, and I'm gonna just like trigger a reflex that goes to the spinal cord and back here, right? So in fact, we have abandoned this very notion of instinct. Because when you talk about instinct, it's like a reflex. Like, I see a black person, I have a bias, I'm going to kill the black person. No, that's not the way it works at all. I'm going to show you. Not at all. Oh, I, okay, so I'm going to, it's too much. Okay, so now I'm going to give you two, I don't know if it's too much. No, no, no. It's a bit too much. Right here, you can see it. Ooh. <laughs> so, I'm going to give you two different views now. You remember when I told you? Do you remember when I told you when I started, I said, what I really like? And I hope I can share this enthusiasm for openness. It's to see contradictions. So I'm going to show you now two views of what we discuss that are not compatible. And maybe both are wrong. Maybe 20 years from now, we will see a better model. Right? So what I'm saying is that there is not a single view. It's, it's, it's not because you do science that what you say is correct. I would say that I'm hoping that when you do science, you show the evidence and the theory supported by the evidence, but you should be open to criticism. That's why I don't value psychoanalysis, because psychoanalysis is not a science. You cannot contradict psychoanalysis. You could not falsify psychoanalysis. It's a closed, closed system, like astrology. Astrology is always right, always. So it's not science. Science is open to evidence and then say, you know, I'm wrong. There is new evidence, a new theory. Okay, so now I'm going to do that now in real. So what, what we have learned from social psychology for the past 50 years is that we do this kind of social categorization, which we do, by the way. I have no anything else. So all humans, all of us across the planet, we sort, we sort ourselves and other people into categories all the time, right? We do that all the time. It's automatic. It's automatic. Automatic. You don't even think. So when we see people, I see you, young lady next to me. I, what the first thing I want to look at you? It's gender, sex, whatever. For me, it's most, mostly the same. It's complex. Me, sex and gender, most of the time, it's go together, right? There's a few cases where in between, I don't care. I care about, you know, the mean. Most people are either male or female, and you can see. Because today, people, yes, you can choose your gender. Come on. Oh. Yeah, some can. Some can, I'm sure. Most of us, we cannot. So I see you. First thing I see, gender. I make a category, which is the case, right? I look at you, female. Woman, sorry. No biology speaking. Age, that's a huge one. Age. When you look at someone, the first thing, the one of the first things that pops up to your mind is sex, gender, and age. Old man, young man, always a young man here, right? You can tell very quickly. He's a young man, I'm an old man. Right? What do we do? Male, female. You can see races or ethnicity. When I say race, there is nothing bad about it because in the US, we use race a lot. If I go to France, you should not even say the word race. It doesn't exist. Fine. I say something else. Language. We speak Spanish, we speak English, French, who cares? Russian, German, those are things. You can tell very quickly. Uh, religion, if you have a religion. Nations, if you care about your nations. Culture. Your social economic status, you can tell very quickly. People are high or low, uh, status, many others. And within this categorization, categorization the, the, that's on the slide, it's like the fact that we have our mind this very quick mechanism to put things together. That's all it means. 
we put things together. Yeah, I'm gonna tell ask you. Uh, such as objects together, those are objects that goes together, right? People are people, IDs, and to finish this slide, there are two categories. If you talk about yourself now as a person, you can use a personal identity, such as this is Anna. It's I. She should sorry, she said I am the, I don't, I don't really look like Anna, right? So this is Anna. She can say I am Anna. That's the self personal identity. But Anna can also say, you know, we are female, us, all female here are female executives. That's the social identity, right? So you as such, Alexandra, what's your name? Veronica. Veronica Alexandra, you know, they can say, you know, we are two, um, when I say female, we say female in the US, female academics. Yeah? Okay, so they define themselves now, both of them, as in this category, social identity, right? But then I can look at you, say, tell me about yourself. I don't care about you as such, you as yourself, and you're gonna tell me about your identity. So that's one model. Yeah, excuse me. I want to say one thing you said is que en esta categoría social, cuando tú, cuando vives en otro país, por ejemplo, en el en Londres, y hablas inglés con acento, crees que eres tonto. Entonces, no porque hablas con acento eres tonto. Y ellos, ¿sí me ves? No porque hablas Sure, I do. No porque hablas con acento eres tonto. Porque así pasa. O sea, es, es la definición. A lo mejor en el Reino Unido que, que no quieren a los extranjeros, si hablas, si hablas una, eh, un acento diferente, eres tonto. Mm. Y no es cierto. O sea, tú piensas igual que ellos. Tú eres inteligente igual que ellos. Pero la percepción social es una percepción de una clase mínima, de una clase muy baja. ¿Qué piensas sobre eso? Ok, so, um, we, we could spend like one day on, on languages and, and, and different accents. Uh, and I don't think London is a good uh, example for you because uh, London is a huge city and I think most of the people in London are not from London. So, I don't, I, I'm sure there are people who, when they listen to there are, I'm seeing, uh, sorry, let's say, sl I'm going to slow down. I'm pretty sure there are British people from London, when they hear someone speaking English with an accent from Pakistan, they categorize this person as a Pakistani and is not as good as I am. That's probably, that is called prejudice, as you said, absolutely. I'm not talking about that, okay? Because then I can say, and I, I, I'm, I'm not yet, yet on prejudice. We're going to talk about prejudice. It's more about, you know, uh, uh, so I was looking like where where are living where are most of the French people not living in France living right so among the whatever 80 million French many uh, not many some of them live outside the country right like me I'm an American now so anyway I don't count and it's in London the the biggest foreign population in London are French and you know where they work? Banks, mm -hmm. most of them. So very high level jobs. Do they have a French accent in English? I don't know. Some of them probably do, some don't, I don't know. And I don't think you will categorize the French as being stupid because if you know they are in banks and lawyers, usually they are pretty smart, probably smarter than the people who categorize this way. So uh, we have to be careful where we go there, right? So anyway, so those are social categories. Um, Okay, those social categories are very important. I, again, and I'm gonna show you some s neuroscience data. Because we use these social categories, as you said, I'm trying to be positive, so probably to say, you know, oh, he speaks Spanish with a, I don't know, what's bad for you in Spanish? <laughs> Let's say if I speak Spanish with a Russian accent, sounds pretty bad, right? <laughs> But you don't want to say I'm stupid. Maybe I'm a, I'm a diplomat and I speak 16 languages. Who knows? Everybody has an accent. No worries. Anyway, so we use these social categories that are very important because when we categorize, categorize people, and those are real people, you know? These people I know, by the way. My son is there, by the way. Look, Glenn is my son. 
It's the little blonde kid you saw this morning. This is what he is. Okay, that's my son Glenn. And when we look at people, and when you know something, we categorize these people and we use these categories to predict their mental states and behavior all the time. And of course we can be wrong. Of course you can hear someone speaking in London with say a Spanish accent and someone who say that person is stupid probably is drawing the wrong inference. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not true. So I will be very careful myself being a foreigner everywhere I live to categorize people by based on the accent. I'm going to use different cues. Accent is one, but I'm going to take more cues before I make this kind of judgment. But not everybody is smart. Uh, so, example. So if I show you, you know, you have everything on the screen. But I show these two young ladies, right? They are beautiful. Beautiful young ladies, dark hair, you know? One is called Aviva. It means springtime in Hebrew. I know her. She's French. She's from Paris. And I can tell you stuff. So the first thing you see is that, oh, they are female, female, and a male. Already you make categories, for sure. They are young people. They are all looking good, right? My son looks good, no? No, oh, come on. They are look good. They are good, good looking people, but they are female and a male. That you can tell very quickly. Then I'm going to tell the name, Aviva. Oh, so if you don't speak Hebrew, makes nothing to me. I know what it means. It means, because I'm Jewish, it means springtime. And then there's another one called Amara, which means something I remember, like uh, something very nice in Arabic. But Aviva, I'm telling you, she's a Princeton grad. Must be very smart to go to Princeton. Uh, she's French. So you can bring everything you have about the French. Maybe good things or bad things. I don't know. Uh, she's from Paris. And people have all these stereotypes about Paris. People living in Paris the way they are. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. It doesn't matter. And she's Jewish, by the way. And again, that can trigger a lot of stereotypes about Jewish. And maybe some of these stereotypes are true. We're going to talk about that. Amara, she's a Yale grad. I choose this lady because I know them and I you know, they're a good school. Yale is also a very good top school in the US. She's American. She's from Boston. And she happened to Muslims. Muslim, sorry, Muslim. Doesn't wear the burqa. Right? And then I show you this young male, Glenn. He's a Bard grad in New York. He's American. He's from Chicago. Is that easier? All right? Okay, so look at that. Look at that. I told you. What I show you here. I'm sorry for the long ladies there. They are more comfortable. Can, can you show me? These, these are these are easy. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. What I want you to be excited so much. What I want you to be excited that I am who I am is that whatever we study like cognitive biases or heuristics or group mechanisms. I think it's that's what you do in your center. It's so much va more valuable and fun when you bring multiple perspectives. And I want to show you that even just me, myself, again, I'm not the smartest person on earth, I'm not saying that, but even in my work, I always want to bring more than one perspective. I gave you one this morning and today, again, evolutionary theory. If you remove evolutionary theory, there's no way you can understand biases. Biases have evolved for some reasons. Maybe you don't like the reasons today. It doesn't change anything. It's part of our evolution. You can't deny it. You can't deny it. It doesn't help. I want to bring psychology, which I do, but I want to bring also neuroscience, because neuroscience is a powerful way to look at mechanism. Oh, it's not the only way, but it's a powerful way to look at mechanism. So back to our faces, there is 40 years of research when you use ERPs, electroencephalography. So you put electrodes on the scalp and you can measure brain reaction, right? Millisecond by millisecond. It's, ex it's much better than fMRI. What I showed you this morning, it's horrible. It takes five seconds to get this image. This millisecond Millisecond by millisecond, I can tell you what happens in the brain. And what I show you here is that when you show faces, even to babies, the first thing they categorize is sex. It takes 145 milliseconds, 145 milliseconds 
to say female, male. It's quick, isn't it? It's automatic. This one is very quick too. You can tell that these three persons, Amara, Aviva, and Glenn, are Caucasian. They're from the same race. You agree? If I show you someone like a black kid from the same college, that's black and white, that's different race. Or Asian, like this morning, remember? We had Asian faces, Caucasian faces. Amara, Aviva, and Glenn belong to the same race. That takes 180 milliseconds. It's not half a second, one. <laughs> it's even less than that. Isn't it cool? Cool. Science is cool. It's very quick, very quick. It's automatic, and it's there very early. You don't need anyone to learn that. Babies do categorize race and gender very quickly. You don't need to learn. Why? Because it's adaptive to survive, right? So when people ask, you know, why do we need to know male or female? Huh? How do we reproduce, right? So what makes humans, not human special, mammals? Why do we have evolved sex? sex? Why do we have evolved sex? Yeah, I'm talking about as a biologist in evolution. To reproduce. And then because we have sex reproduction, not all animals have that, we do, mammals, it means then when we reproduce, we reshuffle 50% of the genes from one female, 50% with the, your husband, you had babies with. That's the reshuffle. So it's, it's, it, it brings a lot of variability, right? So you would assume that if our species, like many other species, are based on sex for reproduction, you better have mechanisms in your brain to know who is male or female, don't you? It's that simple. Well, if you don't know who you're going to have sex with, you're in trouble. Right? I don't want to be more graphic than that. Come on. Okay. But then let's go to in-group, out-group. This is a study. Oh, can you hear me there in the back? Yeah. So this is a study done in the Netherlands. And what he, they did, they used uh, pictures of 16 Dutch-looking women, like this one at the top, the blonde girl. They also used 16 Muslim women wearing the headscarf, and all, all the stimuli were equated for attractiveness, right? The, this Arabic woman is extremely, uh, I shouldn't say hot, because that <laughs> <laughs> attractive, right? She's beautiful, I mean beautiful. Lots of makeup, too. Uh, and the Dutch woman, beautiful too. So they are all beautiful ladies. So it's not about, you know, one is nice, the other one is ugly. They are all nice. And what they showed is that those, uh, the subject in the study doing ERPs were um, non-Muslim students in Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And uh, I, I don't have, I can't go there. Y I can show you that very quickly they make the distinction between the female based on their groups, right? So very quickly they categorize their brain. They don't even think about that. When they see Muslim, non-Muslim, it's very quick. It's uh, 150 milliseconds, and the P, what we call P200, which is like 200 milliseconds after, after the face is on the screen, there is a distinction in the brain between Muslim, non-Muslim. Who cares? Do you care? I care. I care, yeah. Am I too long? No? I don't want to finish. I'm happy to, uh, maybe it's too much for you, it would break no, for no, you. No, I think we're, we're fine. Okay, so why this is important? Because, you know, there are problems, I don't know in Mexico, but in Europe there are huge problems. Mm -hmm. And we cannot deny that. We have to fix them, for sure. We want people to be happy. We want people to be together. We want people to follow the rules the social norms we talked this morning. But there are problems because, like, example, that's true, that's why they did the study. S in some, uh, uh, like in the Netherlands, it's the same in France, uh, they are Muslim who want to have Muslim-only beach because Muslim, they feel uncomfortable when they see people like that. You see? Why? And that's based on these very early mechanisms. So you can have this gut reaction say, you know, okay, so I am not Muslim. I kind of like this one, personally. I do. 
And when I see that, I'm, I, I don't like it. But you know, we have to go beyond that. It's not about lacking. It's that we make these categories very quickly, and people care a lot, not everybody, right? So this is a huge problem in, in Europe, not in the US, by the way. We, are not, we don't have the same problem in the US. We have Muslims. We don't have that. I, I don't know why it's in Europe, but in Europe there is this problem, and I think we need to have more science to tell us you know, how we can, what are the mechanisms. We need to know the mechanisms if we want to change them. That's what I'm trying to say. Because we are very quick at making this distinction. You don't have to go to the beach. You see the face, whoop, immediately. Because I'm not Muslim, whoop, okay? And again, I'm not saying that's good or bad. It is a fact. Then you can make whatever value judgment. I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't need to do that. So you want to have a break. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Can I have a break? No, no, no. no it's just for you. Yeah. You guys. Les parece que tenemos, hay que hacer pipi galleta. Este, sí, ¿no? Tantito nada más para cinco minutos. ¿Les parece? Nada más como que comen un café, algo de galletas y regresamos. Porque creo que se va a alargar un poquito, ¿no? Entonces, este, creo que podemos hacer. Eh, hey, for you too. Sí. <laughs> Entonces, hagamos un pequeño break, ¿no? O sea, la pipi galleta y regresamos aquí en cinco o diez minutos. ¿Les parece bien? Sí. No, no, it's long, but I prepared a lot. I prepared a lot. Just stay here yeah. like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> if it was with me, I, 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 I am not feeling That's fine, weeks on that. Weeks, weeks, yeah. weeks, weeks for you. You want to have some coffee and maybe some water? Just water, what, what? Oh, no, 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 good, good, no. We have a nice lunch, we're so good. Oh, thank you so much. Whew, this is more candy. That I agree with that. Uh, it's more an art than science. Yeah. It's a way of relating. Yeah. Yes, uh, that I agree. The mechanism of yes. No, then we agree with. I agree with you. <laughs> 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 I, I don't think it's going to be depressing. Yeah. Sure.
I could get in the last thing and then the new work and then actually playing the video which was the best I mean so I know oh, no. La mañana sufrimos mucho, era un congelador, sí, sí. O sea, sí está así, calorcito, pero soportable. Sí. Sí, ¿verdad? Sí, no se puede regular. Sí, no. No, hombre, estaba así de... Es que también dependía de donde estuviera sentado. O sea, yo estaba en medio donde dan las tres salidas, entonces era así literalmente, sentía que estaba ahí en el congelador. Pero como nadie más se fijaba, luego me da pena. Sí, porque es bueno, la que tiene frío eres tú, ¿no? Pero sí, después afuera escuché así varias personas de... Es que tú te estabas levantando y... Hace poco fui también a un evento al Instituto de Investigaciones Sociales y también estaba el aire así mal. Híjole. Sí, sí, claro, claro. Pero creo que es eso, que, que no tiene para regularse. O sea, que o está prendido. Pero a lo mejor sí ya sabes, pues, de que vienes preparado, ¿no? Así de traes tu chamarrita. Sí, no, yo hice esa cosa. El privado. Esa que dice que sale de que se va por la libre. Todas las entradas siempre hay alguien que se va por la, por la libre, pero evolutivamente tiene una explicación también, porque es la que, o sea, el estilo hay dos penúltimos, ¿no? Sí. Uh -huh. Exacto. Sí, no, imagínate. Sí. Sí, lo problema es cuando se pierde el equilibrio y entonces la cooperación... Sí, o sea, entonces como que el, los grupos tienen que mantener ciertos niveles de cooperación. Entonces, si hay una sobrepoblación de free riders, la, cooper, la cooperación se rompe y entonces ya hay un problema eh, en, el, en el colectivo, ¿no? Pues sí, pudiera aparecer. Sí. Las repercusiones de, su, de sus actos. Sí, te estás sobreponiendo la norma de la delincuencia. ¿no? O sea, es como... sí, aunque entre ellos hay, un, hay, un, hay una capacidad de cooperación tremenda. O sea, su organización. También está, depende de que tienen una, una capacidad clara de Sí, pero a lo mejor, bueno, lo que pasa es que como nos toca muy de, de cerca, es más difícil ver como las dimensiones, pero si por ejemplo pensamos en los pueblos guerreros que eran los aztecas, por ejemplo, ¿no? O en Cazadores, o sea, la época de los cazadores y recolectores que había grupos que eran invasores y que eran como los narcos, ¿no? O sea, llegaban, mataban, violaban a las mujeres, etcétera, etcétera. O sea, ahora la distancia 
Nosotros es evolutivamente, esos grupos tuvieron un papel en la evolución. Ahorita nuestra moral nos dice, no, el narco, ¿no? porque hay normas. ¿no? Pero yo de repente los veo como, como esos grupos, ¿no? justamente que iban por encima de toda la, la normativa. Sí, las mezclas generaron alternativas. Este, eran más nómadas ¿no? o sea si todos los grupos hubiesen sido sedentarios siempre no habría habido 